Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Gerhard Medicus, who is a biologist and psychiatrist, whose academic base now is in Munich, the mecca of modern psychiatry, of course. Dr. Medicus, please come and talk to us on human ethology and the understanding of personality disorder. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. I, I'm a little bit both uh, a biologist and a psychiatrist. After I finished my medical studies, I was uh, assistant for research at the zoological department in Vienna for two years. And then since this time, I made my education as general practitioner and then as a psychiatrist. And as a psychiatrist, I'm now retired since four years, and now I concentrate on human ethology. Uh, when I was invited uh, coming here, uh, mm. I, my intention was to present something which you don't find in my book yet. So uh, I make a connection between table 7 and table 10 of my book, but I didn't mention personality disorder in my book yet, so maybe in one of the next editions. So I, I will argument on two levels, on the ultimate and proximate level, and the first topic will be the Zürich model from uh, Norbert Bischoff. It's a very sophisticated model, and I will, within this model, I will concentrate on the bonding strategies and on the bonding types of Ainsworth, which can be interpreted on the basis of the coping strategies. Interesting concerning personality disorders, this is a first ethological argument, is that Personality disorder has to do with imprinting similar developments. Bowlby and Main spoke about fixed working models on regulation <coughs> of emotions. It's more or less an emotional problem, not so much a, co a problem of cognition. More learning and wrong and therapeutic learning is possibly neurosis and personality disorder is more this imprinting uh, aspect. So the, what I present today is only a working hypothesis. So just to start the discussion of this subject uh, on an ethological evolutionary basis, there are several competing models which have a similar approach so there are several other authors who have theories about personality disorders, starting uh, with the uh, attachment theory of Bowlby. And today I present a more or less human ethological, ethological uh, perspective. In part two, I will say something about the roots of sociality and I concentrate on the emotional and <coughs> cognitive aspects, you will see that uh, both viewpoints are useful to, for the discussion. So the first slide, I, the first word I give to Charles Darwin, and I give him also the last word of my lecture. It's really very surprising how far Darwin was already, and I'm very glad that I could visit yesterday his house in Down. So, the, oh, sorry, the fixed working models is from Mary Main and uh, Ainsworth, and, uh, but it f fits very well in the statement and fits very well to the statement Darwin made in the book, uh, Descent of Man, 1871. 
the next slide is very well known already, but just to present old knowledge which is well known since 30, 40, 50 years, that only a very low percentage of prisoners with violent criminals had a stable and long-term care caregiver during childhood. 50% had more than five successively at the age of 14. Very interesting, 90% are male. We don't know if girls have the same bad childhood, why male have a higher risk to become criminals. <coughs> and a very interesting statement of Perry, this American uh, psychiatrist, he was uh, at court, he had to make a psychiatric statement about Leon. Leon was 14 years old and drunk when he wanted to pick up two 12-year-old girls. The two girls refused and then he killed the two girls. And he was surprised that family members of the killed girls were watching at court and they were crying. And he, he asked his psychiatrist, why are they crying? I am the one who's going to jail. So this shows he had a disastrous childhood, Leon, and, but it shows uh, how important childhood is for life success and also for personality disorder. Now I start the Zurich model and I regret it deeply that Norbert Bischoff is, to my mind, one of the most important international psychologists, but he wrote excellent books. He told me that he wrote, he had his 89th birthday a few weeks ago. He's still very healthy. I visit him once or twice a year because to discuss him, some details with him. But I regret it very much that his books are not translated into English. It's really a pity. Uh, it's six books, 400, 600 pages, and he wrote on each book about 30 years. So it's really very highly polished, highly intellectual books. Okay, he developed the attachment theory of Bowlby and expanded the theory. So the security system uh, is already known to Bowlby. And uh, children have a need, uh, an appetence for protection. And if they are separated from the parents, then they show anxiety and grief. But even children a few days old can experience overfamiliarity if the mother is too close. And then even in the first days, they can show tedium. This is, was Bischoff's idea, a very dynamic idea, because he mentions uh, the, uh, what was it, op op opposed instincts. Da Darwin called it opposed instincts. So separation anxiety and tedium are opposed instincts according to Darwin. He mentioned this term, opposed instincts, I think already 1859. What is also known in the model from Bowlby is that children need high security to be able to show curiosity and exploration. And if there is a lack of novelty, uh, then the, the children show boredom. And if there is too much novelty, small children show anxiety. And now comes another step made by Bischoff. He mentioned also within this Zurich model the autonomy system. Uh, it correlates with self-confidence if you have, if a child has support from the mother exploring the world, then it will develop a higher self-confidence. <coughs> And if the child has not enough support from the mother, the child will remain in a dependent position. What 
Bischof also mentions is the roots of the autonomous system. It's the power for dominance, the recognition motivation, and the competence motivation. Uh, I will mention these three roots again in, in the ultimate causes in the second part of my slides. If uh, a child doesn't get the autonomy it wants to have, especially from the age of 18 months onwards, it shows assertiveness. And if the novelty is too, too excessive and the child not yet experienced it enough, it might react with submission. So this is maybe the most important uh, contribution to the uh, attachment theory of Bowlby made by Bischoff. And it's only a few single short papers available in English. So I, I made the links on the page and also on the literature list on the last slide. Now I explain assertiveness and submissiveness. Assertiveness with the help of coping strategies like inventiveness and aggression and submissiveness through coping strategies such as supplication and acclimatization. And if you, I go back to this slide, so you have already a notion that we are close to personality disorders. So these are all concepts, uh, the security, security anxiety system, the arousal system, the autonomy system, plays an important role in, in exploring and describing uh, personality disorder and also certainly concerning these coping strategies. I explained them, the coping strategies are, is a very ethological approach. I, if facing a hurdle or striving for a goal, then she or he can react aggressively and destroy it. We know the personality disorders who are specialized on this type of reaction, or she or he can find an intelligent way to overcome it. Very clever, I have, I'm already grandfathers, I have four grandchildren and I'm always again and again very surprised how clever they sometimes they try, it's sometimes aggressive, and but sometimes very clever. She or he can acclimatize and deny the goal. And she or he can beg for support, and this is uh, supplication. So we have the concept assertiveness again and submissiveness again to put these coping strategies in a system. So uh, now I explain the bonding types of Ainsworth. Here we have an increase from left to right concerning the bonding types ABC, an increase of assertion and an increase of supplication, and here from right to the left, an increase concerning acclimatization. The attachment type is the pseudo-independent, is here with low aggression and low supplication and high acclimatization in uh, uh, type A. The really independent and best grown up child is the B type with a strong inventiveness and C uh, is the insecure ambivalent and dependent child. You know these uh, attachment styles are made by Ains were made by Ainsworth with this child separation test. In a, a test situation the children are separated and when they are unified again with the mother then they show, according this uh, 
uh, attachment styles, a different reaction according to A, B and C. And what makes me happy is that we can put them in a system after the wife of Norbert Bischoff, she is Doris Bischoff, she also wrote a very excellent developmental psychology book, which is also not available in English, it should be translated. Uh, but uh, the publishers uh, don't have the money for a translation. I don't know how it works. Here we have, now I put the coping strategies in another framework for the discussion of the personality disorders. You remember the three types, invention, supplication is linked with the omega strategy and aggression is a little bit more linked with the alpha strategy. And the internal coping is acclimatization and revision. So uh, acclimatization is similar to the psychoanalytic concept of displacement and revision is similar to the psychiatric concept of denial. It might be a weakness of my perception and thinking that I don't know in personality disorder how much displacement and denial is involved. So I just mention it here because um, in in the discussions with Bischoff, Bischoff was very fast deciding this is denial or this is displacement, but I am not so fast and good in this concept. I am not a psychoanalyst, so I avoid these concepts now and I make another topics of internal coping. Internal coping, I give examples uh, which arose primarily of my ultimate view on the subject. So internal coping uh, is one aspect, the frustration tolerance from an ethological view of points is calm, wait and see, or precipitate coping reaction. Very fast reaction is the opposite of frustration tolerance. And in uh, human ethology, we sometimes speak about beneficial social emotions or also in developmental psychology. And because many personality disorders have no sense uh, for beneficial social emotions, therefore I chose the concept of pro-social coldness. And in the next slides, I give these concepts a certain color to the letters and to the background to classify, to make a decision if it's only highly activated in a certain uh, personality disorder, as I made the example here with supplication, or if it really a fixed in working pattern in the sense of imprinting, uh, as I showed here with supplication. The same uh, three coping strategies with another example here aggression highly activated because of the disorder and the imprinting uh, aspects uh, made because of the background here yellow. <coughs> I start according the order as we find it in the ECD 10 so the first personality order there is the paranoid one and I uh, classified it a little bit with my words, sometimes according to ECD-10 and sometimes with my own experience with this patient. So uh, it's a mix of uh, my own view and, uh, um, and what I show here concerning paranoid personality disorder, it's a pity that we can't make e-voting now. Because if we, this is my decision how I would make my e-voting concerning the, the involvement of the different uh, coping strategies. Uh, I know if we 
maybe there's uh, 40, 50 people, I don't know if we would make e-voting, voting, then sometimes you would maybe agree with me, sometimes not. So this is the first time that the coping strategies of Norbert Bischoff I applied to personality disorder. I called him and asked him if he knows somebody. He said he doesn't know anybody. And he has uh, two or three daughters. They are psychotherapists, so nobody knows. So it's a very first approach. And so uh, I'm not, uh, I have to agree if you have a different opinion. Very typical for paranoid personalities is the high aggression. Um, a university professor I got to know personally and <coughs> one of my colleagues had the same uh, mechanics for the car. And uh, the mechanic asks my colleague, this professor must be very paranoid. He has on several places of the car uh, hidden weapons. <laughs> So this is the uh, very high appendence for security, a very high arousal concerning fear, high desire for autonomy, and high aggression. This is, and the bond is very ambivalent. Bad and demean others because of anxiety and arrogance but at the same time, they are dependent upon the loyalties. So concerning the Zürich model of Bischof, it's a high disintegration within the Zürich model. Because in the Zürich model, if I have a high evidence for security, then I can't be aggressive. If I have a whole arousal of fear, I could only be aggressive as a cornered rat but not as a fearful child. Uh, and also the high desire for autonomy doesn't fit together. Uh, and very interesting, other personality disorders with high evidence for security and arousal of fear uh, have not the combination with high autonomy, desire and aggression. So. Uh, this is maybe the most disintegrated uh, personality disorder from the view of the Zürich model. Maybe worse than uh, paranoid personality disorder is the borderline types, which I don't mention today. It's too difficult for me. I avoid it to mention this type. OK. We come to the schizoid personality disorder. There is maybe no, <coughs> maybe no external coping, but quite a high uh, arousal concerning fear. They avoid social bonds because of the social risks and the risks of disappointments. With my experience with street patients, maybe there are two types. One type who really don't need any contact and live highly isolated. And another type who would like to have more contact, but is not able to find the friends for contact. Interesting is the desire for autonomy. So the other personality disorders with fear and uh, uh, show less desire for autonomy. I forgot to mention here. Uh, here, I was not sure, is it just highly activated or is it imprinted also here? So there, I activated both fields. So I, I couldn't decide, I, I couldn't make a decision. I forgot to mention it before. So in the next step, I will be glad if somebody could make, <coughs> maybe in Austria or, or somewhere else, uh, e-voting concerning this uh, disorders, because to check personality disorders with this system is hard work busy, and e-voting would be could be made 
quite fast. The antisocial, we all know, aggressiveness high, weak prosocial, beneficial emotions, no feeling for guilt and shame, low, low empathy, low frustration tolerance, prosocial coldness, and high desire for autonomy. The narcissistic and histrionic personality disorder, uh, they prefer the alpha strategy and aggression, but if they find any solution anymore, if, if they are cornered, then uh, some of them show omega strategy. Uh, one brother of me is a musician and he was playing with the violin in the Mozart Deum Orchestra in Salzburg and uh, at the f festivals in summertime they had made a concert and a famous man from ballet uh, was dancing to the music and something didn't work as he wanted. So he really threw himself on the floor, as I know it from my two or three old grandchildren. <laughs> so he was really a very famous, all of you, or most of you would know his name, I don't want to mention it, but he reacted crying like a child, throwing himself on the floor. This is supplication, and we know it also from, from uh, uh, our psychiatric departments. Low frustration tolerance, prosocial coldness, high desire for autonomy, and maybe high fear. Maybe this high, fe maybe this high fear and aggression and supplication are the effects of the imprinting like learning, like frustration tolerance pro-social coldness and desire for autonomy. So the opponents are fought against. These are the department leaders in the hospitals, where the department leader he has some high competence in one special uh, surgeon, for example, is a good surgeon. And if he's the boss, he throws out all the uh, surgeons in his team, he, which are almost as good as he is. What I tell you is true. It was a very, uh, this man was almost drunk and when he looked in, his, in the mirror and watched his face. It was wonderful to see his admiring himself. And uh, so he had a big department and uh, uh, if in the neighbor, I was working in different hospitals in different countries. So if in the neighbor room, they didn't know how to go on with this operation, then he stopped his own private patient, dressed and sterile again, helped in the neighboring operation. Meanwhile, the first patient had to wait one hour, then he dressed again and went back. So this is this narcissistic boss who eliminates opponents because he wants the glorious leader of the department. Attachment is ambivalent, self-centered, and very interesting, the self-esteem fluctuations which fit together with the opposite strategies between alpha and omega. <coughs> The compulsive personality disorder, here the invention is a reaction to the imprinting like working models. Uh, if you have compulsive members in your team, they can, if they're intelligent, they can explain you perfect why they are so compulsive. You have no chance to argue against them. And uh, so they use their invention to justify their reaction and they uh, uh, 
don't use invention to solve the problems. They just are inventive for their personal arguments. Again, like the dependent patients and the anxiety patients, high evidence for security, arousal high, and but not depressive and not dependent because of the desire for autonomy and alpha strategy. Desire for security, so this is the appetence for security through order and they have high anxiety concerning own and others' mistakes. The avoidant personality disorder uh, have high supplication, high developed omega strategy, uh, the invention is only used to explain the avoidance, high appetence for security and high arousal concerning fear. Social reassurance is important. They need always somebody behind them to excuse their decision. It is my boss who wants it like this. They have no own opinion and uh, decision and they show a strong self-abasement. And the last one is the dependent. The last one in my PowerPoints now is the dependent personality disorder and uh, with high omega strategy and again the evidence for security high and the arousal high. But in the opposite way here the arousal is higher in the avoidant and the dependence for security maybe not as high and in the dependent vice versa the dependence for security high and the arousal not as high concerning fear but this is my assessment it's maybe you have a different uh, experience with the patients so at any of the shown slides I have some patients I personally know and I was thinking about my experiences with these patients. Very interesting also, uh, this is not interest, this is like a child craving for security and support. So some of the personality disorders are excellent in a better position in hierarchy and some of them are maybe 10, 20 years in a better position and then the alpha gets retired and then all the people say, yeah, you made an excellent job in the better position, you become the next alpha. And they completely, uh, it, in a few weeks or months, it ends in a disaster because without the background of the alpha, they are not able to make decisions. Very interesting also the overestimation, the self-abasement according to the omega strategy and the overestimation of others. Yeah, now I come to the second part concerning the coping strategies of Bischoff. I forgot to mention two points, but I don't want to go back to the slides. The autonomy system is dependent also not only of the experience of the child, it's also dependent upon the age. We have a very fast development of autonomy in puberty. But still, how much autonomy we develop is dependent how much safety and security we had from the parents. And another factor which influences personality is the rank, high ranked people very often change their personality. It's a very interesting aspect. So high ranking people get more vulnerable, more sensitive concerning critic and more narcissistic. So therefore it makes sense, for example, in politics to, in America, president can be twice president and then he must uh, be retired and, and another president comes. This makes sense because of the change of personality through, uh, through 
through the rank. Uh, the changes of personality is in part caused by the submissiveness, submissive behavior of the uh, members in the team. Uh, Michael McGuire in Los Angeles uh, separated the alpha with a one-way glass. If the alpha could not see, if the alpha could see his group, but the group could not see the alpha, so the group couldn't sh show submissiveness. So he was the low with serotonin. As soon as he put in a normal glass, so that the visual communication worked with threatening and submissiveness of the group, then the serotonin, serotonin went up again. So, okay, so this is also an aspect which should be considered from histological viewpoint, which is not part of the Zurich model and which uh, has to do with personality disorder, but we can't use the term personality disorder because the definition in uh, the DSM-5 and ECD-10 is a little bit different. It must be this, this, you can't change according to the hierarchy your personality disorder, but interesting that the personality changes. Now we come to the second part, to the ultimate causes, to the roots of sociality, and I needed this ultimate view as a background to describe the internal coping strategies. So I give again the word to Charles Darwin. And Darwin not only brought these theoretical examples, he had also a real example that out of brute provisioning was the precondition for social behavior. It's a very very important remark of Darwin. This is in Origin of Species and this is mentioned in Descent of Man. Now I try to present a reconstruction. This is table seven in my book. Uh, so the emotional aspects are the green steps and the cognitive aspects, the blue ones. And as Darwin knew already, brute care was a precondition uh, for love, attachment and friendliness. And uh, yeah, and we again find the terms we found in the Zurich model like evidence for security, separation, anxiety, and so on. As we know already from the example of uh, this American uh, author Perry, after a deprived childhood, persons often have a low sense for love, attachment, or friendliness, and the lack, and the lack of the emotional basis for self-esteem. So the self-esteem needs also a basis in the early childhood. This, so the First steps is now smaller letters, but identical words, so don't read this step anymore. In social behavior, here I show what Darwin said two slides before. Uh, intimacy, attractive behavior, reconciliation have their roots in brute provisioning. Harmonical to pie up to pious, this is mammals in Southeast Asia, and in captivity you can measure with a watch how much they kiss. Harmonical pairs, pairs kiss in captivity, maybe, be, I don't know, maybe in the wild not as much, but in captivity up to 40 minutes a day. But how did the kiss develop? The first step was this saliva licking baby. The birth is still going on. You see the umbilical cord, and here one baby is licking the saliva of the mother. So this was the evolutionary first step, and this was the second step. This kiss is not homologous with the kiss of apes and humans. So 
the case developed several times independent from one another. Also, the billing, uh, billing birds are, is a way of kissing. So we come, so what these slides with the two bias show uh, was known already by Charles Darwin. So self-exploration is the next steps typical for apes. They show an I and me distinction. I is the proprioceptive perception, and the me is the mentalized person. Because of this distinction, I and me, the chimpanzees and children older than 18 months recognize themselves in the mirror. How much time I have? How many more minutes? Uh, ten minutes. Seven minutes. Ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. OK. So uh, uh, the separation of body and mind is said comes from Descartes. And Descartes calls it res cogitans and res uh, extensa. It was not the invention of Descartes. It was proconsul, the common ancestors of apes and humans, they had already this race, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, race cogitans and race extensa. So because for me this point is so important because uh, the separation between scientific human sciences and humanities mirrors the body-mind problem. The body sciences are this uh, scientific sciences and the mind sciences, the humanities. And the separation started not with the, with the French philosopher, it started with the I and me distinction in the first apes in natural history. Because of, they are also ab able to show empathy and because of empathy, <coughs> comforting behavior. And what is very sad for me, only two species show this desire for rec recognition by display behavior. This is chimpanzees and humans. This forced recognition, throwing rocks around, throwing tree trunks, and if they if a mother is not careful with a baby, using a baby for threatening displays. This is chimpanzees and, uh, and humans. And sometimes if the boss in a department gets angry, he shows this chimpanzee display behavior to uh, show who is the boss and how the hierarchy works. Very important for the definition of this step is the Rouge test. Monkeys, uh, apes with a color in the face, and children after the f uh, 18 months of year, if they see themselves with the f color in the face, they look at the face and uh, try to clean the face. This is the Rouge test, and this is part of the, def the d definition of this step. It's linked with the empathy only those who are able to solve the Rouge test show real empathy. Otherwise, it's mood contagion. Mood contagion you show if in a hospital somebody feels very ill and, I don't know the polite word, throws up. <laughs> I don't know the bad. The, the uh, then it's very, uh, it shows mood contagion. After deprived child, childhood, person often have low pro-social empathy. But this low social empathy is an emotional lack and not a cognitive lack. They always show, almost always are able to show antisocial uh, empathy. Yes, we know. We know these patients. Very interesting. There is, since a few years, empathy training, empathy, empathy training available. I tried to uh, learn something about this, but 
I was retired too early to learn something about empathy training. Now there comes theory of mind of Homo erectus. The definition of this level is the false belief test. And now comes a uh, concept about what others can or cannot know if you know something bad about me then I would have to show shame and they because of theory of mind they develop a desire for a justified appreciation and therefore invented is on this level apologizing for giving maybe this is the crucial step in the development of humans some anthropologist says nothing crucial, qualitatively crucial, did develop after Homo erectus. I am not sure about <coughs> this. We know that some people can't show shame. And now comes some say theory of mind is a quantitatively expanded in reflection. Uh, I personally think that in reflection is qual some qualitative, qualitative new steps, but we can't decide, or I can't decide. It's a question of, of taste. Yes, now the summary and outlook. Conceptual overlaps between human ethology, developmental psychology and psychiatry can en enhance research and discussion. I mentioned that I didn't mention borderline personality disorder and also I didn't mention the attachment type D. New questions arise on this isological contribution and I expect comparisons with other theories on the development of personality disorders to yield reciprocal improvements so I can't present the competing theories of personality disorders available. Some of them are similar what I presented to you now. And I, the last word I give again Charles Darwin. And all speakers from today get my book if you want, so come to me if I don't find you and you get it from me. And this is the literature and thank you for listening. Uh, Dr. Medicus, thank you very much for this original presentation, mixing familiar stuff for us and some unfamiliar stuff. I'm sure people will have points to make and uh, questions to ask. And Riyadh. <coughs> I don't know whether I should use a microphone or help. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. If you could speak from the microphones here, please. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation, Gerhard. Um, uh, I've got just a couple of points that I just want to um, see what your response is to. How, how would you, you, you didn't mention anything about life history in, in your different um, personality types and how that maps, how your ideas map onto life history um, theory yes. approaches. Um, and my second point is, I was fascinated by the issue of context in relation to um, uh, uh, rank and how uh, that changes personality. I mean, we've always known this. There's the, the, the famous saying by Lord Acton, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we, we've known that, but I, I don't think we've mapped it onto the science of it. And I think there was a book by David Owen uh, called Hubris, the Hubris Syndrome. Uh, which deals with this, but again, it didn't. It, there was no connection in these ide with, between these ideas and evolutionary views. So, just your comments, please. First, the life history concerning the single personality disorders. This is the main gap I didn't close. I, the main gap I could not bridge. This. Uh, 
has to be future research. I know uh, uh, developmental psychologists using the coping strategies of Bishop for their own diagnostic uh, assessment of children. So it might, we might need uh, several 10, 20 decades uh, till we get answer to this very crucial. This is the main question testing if, if my presentation makes sense or not. So we, we, have, we have to wait, but the leading scientist doing this research with the children, I showed her this uh, presentation before I came here to discuss it with her and, uh, um, and she told me and showed me all her questioners. She adapted the questioners to the different ages of the children and they use this questioner only for problem, problematic children, not for all kindergarten children. And the second question, the hierarchical aspect, the change of personality, it's, it was just a random chance. I was invited from my last working place to make a one teaching lesson about hierarchy in, in ethology and I didn't want to do it. I avoided it because um, I, I wanted to be scientific when I presented this and not that all my f friends of my team remember, okay, I had with this and this and this problem with some of the heads of the department. So I waited four years till I was ready to talk about it and I, a half a year ago, I presented this uh, evolution of hierarchy, which is in print in German. And so both talks could influence one another. When I was uh, with this presentation, I was ready preparing about one week ago. Then I started to translate it into German by, because this was now the first public presentation. Then maybe I have a chance to present it in German and go on with the discussion and I will try to find support for e-voting and, uh, and maybe some other people and literature can help me to close or bridge the gap you mentioned between uh, the coping strategies of Bischoff and the life history and then the personality disorders. Uh. Yeah, if we could pass the microphone. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned towards the end that you'd omitted uh, discussion of borderline personality disorder. I wasn't sure if that was because of the difficulty in integrating life history theory with ideas you are putting over, or whether there was some other reason why you'd chosen not to deal with what, what in, in practice is often the most challenging yes. and prevalent yeah. uh, personality characteristic that mental health professionals yeah. have to deal with? Uh, I think in the borderline type, there are too many different personality disorders summarized. So also the causes to develop a borderline development is very different causes. Uh, for me, very interesting was that a very high percentage, not all, but a high percentage of borderline patients were sexually abused at the age of maybe 10, 12 of years. So this is no more the part of this coping strategies and Zürich model of Bischoff. So it's, it was too difficult for me. And maybe we must separate in DSM-5 and ECD-10, we have different types of emotional instability and borderline. Uh, and maybe it's even more complicated as, as shown in this schema. So it was too difficult for me. <laughs> so my, my knowledge, my intellect, my intelligence quotient is not good enough for borderline, for the discussion of borderline at this presentation here. 
maybe I would have some arguments uh, as I did very often in my team when we were discussing about single patients and their history. Uh, then I have sometimes I could uh, give arguments from my ethological background. Can I ask in relation to that, in your clinical work, even if you didn't use your model, did you use another model to work with people with borderline personality disorder? In my, in my clinical work, uh, I did not use so much, uh, uh, in the, 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 you know, in the personality disorders, I was not far, this, I, I prepared for this lecture here. So I, I concentrated now the last months on the talk here. And so this is the first presentation. So when I was retired, I was not so far as, as I, am, I am now. And uh, in my clinical work, I, my background was very useful. If I had married people or couples with, which had uh, in problems in their relation and uh, we know that I could use my knowledge about difference between men and women, and uh, I could use my knowledge concerning aggression and uh, inhibition of aggression, concerning mourning and grief. So I could use quite a lot, and uh, but uh, my ethological background was not really accepted in the medical department in Innsbruck. So it was only. I'm very happy that the psychological, psychology department uh, that I can teach since 30 years together with Wolf Schiefenhöfel, the editor of my book, with him together we teach since 30 years, human ethology, and it's, my book is for psychology students obligatory, so they must make an examination about the book. And without the lecture I wouldn't have, wouldn't have written such a book. So, I'm very thankful to the psychologists and the medical psychologists should support it, my career to my, it's my personal uh, assessment, but they didn't even ignore me. They uh, were not interested in my work. Thank you. Question back there. Yeah, I was just curious about the schematic on, on the last page, you know, the comparative primate schematic where you had sort of left reserve theory of mind, I think you didn't even put it for apes. Um, I mean, my understanding would certainly be that that at least chimpanzees um, have their, well, their gradations of it, and this sort of last spanner was, can't do chimpanzees pass false belief tasks, and the, even now false belief tasks, they, they've sort of been shown to pass. So I was curious as to whether you're skeptical about the theory of mind research or, or w why you felt that, that apes don't have theory of mind. You, maybe you're right that chimpanzees have a theory of mind. Uh, the chimpanzees, there is the definitions of the concepts, mood, contagion, empathy, and theory of mind, that the definition is very individual all over the world. Even in the same Austrian Institute, different scientists have different definitions. This is maybe because, so sometimes it's not a question, does the chimp have theory of mind, yes or no? First, it's a question, how do we define the, the concept? And, um, and for the def reason of definition I mentioned at Empathy, the Rouge test, at, and at Theory of Mind I mentioned the False Belief test. And I think that the threatening craving for recognition is on the basis of empathy. Uh, chimpanz chimpanzees have, in hum you can use the empathy pro-social and antisocial. So only chimpanzees and humans, as far as I know, use the empathy antisocial if we, that we hurt our enemies and wound them severely. And the similarity is threatening between chimpanzees and humans. 
in captivity and in the wild, castrations of chimpanzees are documented. But not on the level of theory of mind, I think, on the level of empathy, to harm, to harm the component, to harm the enemy of the neighboring group or in a, and um, so according to the definition as I see it, uh, <coughs> I make this separation as I did it, but uh, nobody knows which definition is finally accepted. And it's also maybe this many definitions available now is also the result. Nobody makes a encyclopedia about ethological concepts anymore. The last encyclopedias were printed before 2000. Now everything is in the internet and now you have in internet hundreds of different definitions and I were glad if there would come again a leading book with uh, other with precise definitions. I, but uh, I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> the, the Yes. When they had this paper showing, I think it was Jim, showing uh, with the videos, um, and it was the first evidence of them passing false belief tasks. And whenever I watch those videos or show it to my student, I, I find them massively unconvincing. But I was wondering whether maybe you were skeptical of them or. or so if you look, for example, to the chimpanzees in the book Chimpanzees Politics of Franz de Waal, where one chimp holds a piece of tree that the other chimp can climb over the electrical fence. There is no theory of mind necessary. They only need empathy with the intentions of the other chimp. But it's a question of definition. And uh, for example, I just read a paper about empathy in rats from an Austrian scientists. Uh, so because it, there is such a confusion how the concepts are defined, uh, is I have I wrote a paper how the def how I make uh, how I see the definition, but I have it only available in German. If somebody speaks German and wants this paper, I can send it to you per email. <laughs> Very brief question. Is it very brief question, please? Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the lecture. Uh, what do you think will be the implications of your model and the treatment of uh, personal? Uh, the question is, what is the implication of your model on the treatment of personality disorder? A brief answer, please. Yes. So, <laughs> by the by, the differentiation between imprinting like fixed patterns and uh, activated patterns, maybe concerning the activate, activation of patterns, you can develop specific treatment for the different uh, personality disorders. So especially for the therapeutic questions, the activation and the imprinting aspects are important to distinguish. But I don't know if if we will have success, therapeutic success. So it's just my personal hope. Well, Dr. Medicus, thank you very much. And perhaps you'll come back in a future meeting and talk to us uh, about your working out of borderline personality disorder. Thank you very much.